have your Bibles, turn to <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 9 and also uh, 2 Kings chapter 1. Hebrews chapter number 9, 2 Kings chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 23 of Hebrews chapter number 9. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once... In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. <clears throat> now those verses that are read to you right there, of all those verses... My guess is verse number 27 is the one that everybody will be very, very familiar with. And as is appointed unto man once to die, but after this to judgment. I notice that phrase after this. We know that death is not going to end it. We know that one day we're going to appear before God. We're going to be judged. If you're saved, it'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. If you're lost, it's going to be at the great white throne of judgment. Also notice that word appointed. You know, we're all familiar with appointments. We, we have them for different reasons, for different things. Sometimes you may not be able to keep an appointment. Sometimes an appointment may get canceled by whoever you're supposed to see. But the Bible says there that it's appointed unto men once to die. So everybody in here has an appointment with death. Everybody. Now we know that there were a couple people in history that left this world before their appointment with death. There was a man by the name of Enoch and a man by the name of Elijah. Now, what excites me today in which we're living is many more. I truly believe in the very near future will leave before their appointment with death. We call this the rapture. And the Bible tells us about this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Now that's those that's been dead that's in the grave right now, the bodies. And this mortal must put on immortality. That's, uh, that's people who are alive right now. We live in mortal bodies that are destined to die. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, this mortal shall I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Ecclesiastes tells us there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Now, the Bible speaks of this first death is appointed a man once, once to die. The first death. But we also know that the Bible speaks of a second death. In Revelation chapter number 20, it talks about this, that if you have part in the first resurrection, blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection on such, the second death hath no power. It goes on to tell you at the great white throne judgment there that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, you do not want to have any part to do with the second death because the second death, there is no hope. There is no hope. Now, the first death, we know this. It was a result of Adam. Adam's sin in the garden. As one man, sin entered into the world, and so 
death by sin. Now here's the thing we all need to understand as I get into the message today. God did not make a fix for the first death. You know, the rapture being the exception. He did not make a fix for the first death. So therefore, everybody in here, everybody, everybody out there is headed for this appointment. Again, barn the rapture. We're all going to die. I guess we could refer to this as a physical death. But here's the good news. God did make a fix for the second death. He made a fix for that. If a man faces again the second death, I guess you could refer to this as a spiritual death. Again, as I said a while ago, he has no hope. He's going to spend eternity in the lake of fire, tormented. So my suggestion to you today, don't die twice. He says in the point of man, once to die. Don't die twice. And you might say, well, preacher, okay, how? As I said, God did not make a fix for the first death, but he did offer a way of escape from the second death. You say, what is it, preacher? Well, I just read it to you. I read it to you in these other verses that are read to you today. In verse, starting in verse number 23. You can go back actually to chapter number 8 and verse number 7. Notice, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. In other words, that Old Testament, the way God did it was, you know, the blood of bulls and goats. If that would have been faultless, perfect, then it would have been no need for Jesus Christ to come. But we know, I mean, and then he goes into chapter number 9. Now, I didn't take time to read this entire chapter. But in chapter number 9, it talks, it starts off, notice in verse number 2 there, for there was a tabernacle made. And we know that God made that tabernacle, and this tabernacle had different sections in it. And one place was called the holy place. It tells you about that. In verse number... Um, in verse number 2 there, it was which is called the sanctuary. But then in verse number 3, it talks about the holiest of all, a place where the high priest would go in once a year and not without blood, verse number 7. But then you notice in verse number 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way in the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. We couldn't go in there. Only the high priest would go in there, and only once a year. And we notice that all of this was really just a picture, a figure, verse number 9, which was a figure for the time then present. You get down to verse number 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. It says, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of heifers sprinkled in the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And so that Old Testament, over and over and over, they had to do it. But Christ came once. It says right there in verse number 26. But now once. See, listen, the, the Catholics, they go, to, they go and they, they observe a, you know, uh, they, they think they got to partake of the Lord, uh, of the, the literal body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ every week. Crucify him over and over and over. Thank God he didn't have to do that. The Bible says, for them must he often. But he don't have to because he only entered once. Because he did all that needed to be done when he offered himself on that cross. It goes on in chapter number 10 and explains all of this. And so thank God, God provided an escape from the second death. And it was through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. Okay. 
So now, going back to the first death, he did not make a way of escape from that other than the rapture. So the first death is certain for everybody. But it is also uncertain in the fact that we don't know when it's going to happen. Nobody in here is guaranteed a tomorrow. Now, there were a few in the Bible that knew when they were going to die. You know, one of them was Aaron. I, it's just, I, I mean, it's kind of comical in my mind. I know it wasn't comical for him, but it's comical in my mind when the Lord came to him that day. He, he came to Moses and Aaron. Both of them were there. And the Lord's talking to him, and he's telling them, he says, okay. It's, he's talking to both of them now, and he says, okay. Oh, you two, and I want you to get your son Aaron. I want you to get your son Elias, and I want you all to go up to Mount Or. And when you get up there, Moses, I want you to strip off all his priestly garments, and I want you to put them on his son Eliezer. Because he's going to die when he gets up there. And Moses, okay, the Lord leads, and Moses, Aaron, and I, okay, everybody go get you stuff so we can get ready to go. And they, we'll meet back here in an hour. So Moses and Eliezer come back in an hour. Where's Aaron at? I mean, that's probably way I'd have done it. I mean, they have to go find an Aaron because Aaron, he's going to die. He knew that when he got up there. Moses, you read about Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 32. It says these were all the words of Moses, the last thing he told him. And God told, after Moses gave him his last words, God told Moses, okay, now I'm going to let you go up on this mountain and I'm going to let you look from this mountain over into the promised land, but you can't go in it. And when you get up there, I'm just telling you, you're going to die. And so Moses, next chapter, he starts up the mountain and he knows he's going to die when he gets up there. He knew it. Joshua said, he told him, said, this day I go the way of all the earth. He was an old man. David, the Bible says he was old and stricken in years. He's based on his deathbed. He calls his son Solomon in there and he says today, he says, I'm going the way of all the earth. Paul said, the time my departure is at hand. These were men that God basically revealed to them that they were going to die. But you got it. The one thing we know about, they were old. They were all old. Paul was about to be executed. So when a person is in those situations and say death is near, I mean, it's not a shock. My mom died. I've told you she was 88 years old. Another guy I know recently died, Greg Carter, 92. Weldon Allen, just this past week, they had his funeral. He was 94 years old. I mean, if you looked on Facebook and you see where one of those passed away, I'll be honest, it wouldn't be a surprise. But the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 21 that death has come up in the window. It's gone out in the streets after the children and the young people. Now, you wouldn't expect that. The man in Luke chapter 12, I mean, the, the Bible tells this night thy soul shall be required of thee. He thought he had, he must have been a young guy. He thought he had plenty of years ahead of him. He said, eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, you've got a long life, but God says, thou fool, this night. And I guarantee you, boy, when people got word of this guy dying, they were in shock. You've you got to be kidding me. I've told you before about that preacher McFadden that preached the revival in Dustin Creek a few years ago. And then him and his wife were on his way home, and 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 they were they were in this car accident, a truck running the back of them. It just snapped his wife's neck, and she just went out and he turned it just like that. I guarantee, you, brother Ted, when he got news of that, they weren't expecting that. Brother Bill Grady, that was with us here recently, you know, he talked about that that last day that he got to see his son, who. He, he, he had, was going, and the Lord just kind of left his heart about, you didn't get enough books. So he turned around and went back home to get more books. And while he's in his driveway, his son pulls up. He has no idea. That's the last time he's going to ever see his son alive. I was up at White Plains recently in a meeting, and the preacher got up to preach. And a couple of years ago, he got a phone call. And when he answered the phone, he was told that his two granddaughters had just died in a car accident. They were in their late teens. My point is, you better make sure you're ready to go today. Thank God God provided a way out. 
that way as a person. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How shall we escape with ne neglect so, no, so great salvation? You won't. You won't. But today, what I want to do for a little while today is I want to look at one of those two people that did not die. And his name is Elijah. Now, here's the thing about Elijah. He's going to die. Because, you see, we talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. There's also the second coming of Moses and the second coming of Elijah. After the Lord comes back and rapture the church out, there's going to be the great tribulation period. The, those two witnesses over in Revelation chapter 11, that, 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 the last two people mentioned in that Old Testament was Moses and Elijah. They're coming back, and they're going to preach. And, at, and the Antichrist is going to kill them. And after about three and a half days, they're going to be resurrected back to life and head up to heaven. <clears throat> but Elijah didn't die when he first came. And I've asked y'all this question a lot recently. What if you knew today would be your last day? What would you do? What would you do? Well, here's the thing. Elijah knew that this was going to be his last day. And I thought, I'll be honest with you, here's what I thought. It is very, very interesting what he did that day and why he did it. And that's what I want to look at. So in your Bibles, I told you to turn to 2 Kings chapter number 2. Elijah's last day. Verse number 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by whirlwind that Elijah went with Elijah from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elijah, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elijah said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elijah and said to him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your, ye your peace. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elijah and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. <clears throat> and Elijah said to him, Tarry, I pray thee, here for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view the, them to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by whirlwind into heaven. Three, Elijah's last day on earth. I noticed as I was reading that, he did not, now he knows it's going to be, but he doesn't spend his last day at church. I noticed he doesn't spend his last day at the hospital talking to the doctor. He did not spend his last day at home with his family. I noticed as I was reading this that Elijah on his last day goes to three different places. And he goes to these three different places because the Lord told him to. And as I'm reading this, I'm asking myself this question, why? What did it really matter? I mean, I, we're not told of anything, anything specific that he did at any of these places. I mean, it's not like, remember when Jesus Christ in John chapter 4, remember what he said? I must needs go through Samaria. We know why that was because there was a woman at a well that 
Jesus Christ was going there to meet that day. But I don't read about anything like that here. So my question as I'm reading this, I'm asking myself this question, why did God tell him to go to these three places? And here's the, what I believe, the reason why God did it. He didn't tell Elijah to go there for Elijah's sake. I believe he told Elijah to go there for our sake. For our sake. <clears throat> God is telling, here's what I believe God is telling every one of us in here today. There are three places you better go to before you leave this world. Three places you better go to before you leave this world. And I, so I want to know what is the significance of these three places? What's so special about them? Now, in the very near future, <clears throat> what I would like to do, I want to make sure that I take all of y'all to those three places. I want you to go there because that's what God wanted you to do. But today, to start with, I just want to take a quick peek at each one of them because, and, and we'll go, get into it. I notice here, I notice first of all, in verse number two, that God told Elijah to go to a place called Bethel. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry, here I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Now, you all familiar, I guess, I hope, with a, this place called Bethel. Remember Bethel? Remember a man by the name of Jacob? Jacob was that deceiver. He tricked his brother out of his birthright. Then he deceived his dad so he could steal Esau's blessings. And Esau had gotten so mad at that point that he was ready to kill Jacob. Well, again, you read about all this, and I'm not, because of time's sake, not going to turn over and read it, but in Genesis 27 and 28, you can read about that. Rebekah hears about Esau. Esau is so mad. Now remember who Re Rebekah is the mother. Rebekah is the one that told Jacob, put it in his head, the plan, the plot, to steal the blessing. And now she hears that Esau is so mad that when Isaac dies, and Isaac thinks he's going to die soon, when dad's dead, I'm killing him. Rebecca hears about that. So what she does is she goes and tells Jacob, you better go. Go down to my brother Laban and just stay down there for a little while. A few days is how she worded it. Now we know that when Jacob leaves, he's going to be gone for 20 years. But Rebecca thinks it's just a few days. See, Jacob was her favorite. Esau was dad's favorite. But Jacob was mom's favorite. And we know, okay, that all took place in chapter 27. So in chapter 28, Jacob leaves. And he's headed down to his, bro, to his uncle Laban's house. Now, he's, he had to flee. He doesn't really have a lot of time to pack up. So basically, he's leaving with basically nothing. Because on his way down there, it, it, it's, it gets nighttime. And he don't even, he don't have no sleeping bag. He don't have nothing. He don't have a pillow. So what he does, he gets this stone. And he uses a, a rock for his pillow. And while he's laying on that stone, he goes to sleep and he has a dream. And he has this vision. And he sees these angels ascending and descending on this ladder. And then the Lord suddenly appears to him and speaks to him. And Jacob, boy, Jacob's just amazed at all of this. And we know from that is, if you read over there, Jacob makes a vow that day. He basically says from this point on, my life is not about me anymore. My life is... It's about you, God. You are going to be my God. That's the vow he made. 
And the Bible says he called the place Bethel. And Bethel, folks, pictures the place where we come to realize life's not about us. Life's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Bethel was a place of denial. <clears throat> where Paul, remember what Paul said, I die daily. Galatians chapter, Paul says in Philippians, for to me to live is Christ. Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lived in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So folks, what God wants you to do before you go home, is he wants you to come to a place in your life where you realize it's not about you. It's all about him. And we are to basically, it's not my will, but thy will be done. We know that Elijah leaves Bethel and God sends him to Jericho. Now we know what happened at Jericho I mean, that's the first place that the Jews come to when they go into the promised land where they're going to have to fight. And, 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 and so, the, and we know that that pictures the very, God says, everything in Jericho is mine. And we know how Achan got in trouble because he stole part of the stuff that was in Jericho. But you remember, and again, I will do this later. I don't have time today. But remember when they got that, remember Joshua got his marching orders. Literally. Remember what they were told to do when they get to Jericho? They were to march around the city one time a day for six days. And when they're marching around the city, they can't say anything. Then on the seventh day, they're supposed to march around seven times. And that seventh time around, they're supposed to shout. And the walls are going to fall down. There's a great lesson there, folks, to learn about the Christian life. Every day in the Christian life is not a bed of roses. Every day in the Christian life, you're not going to have something to shout about. You're going to have a lot of things you're going to have to face in your daily routine of life. Life can be a rut. Life can get boring. Every day. Day after day after day. Get up, read my Bible, pray. Next, get up, read my Bible, pray. Get up, read. But you've got to do it. Day after day. The Bible says the old man is perishing, is, is vanishing. But the new man is renewed day by day. So, at Jericho, you got to realize, if you want to live a big, you got to be diligent. Diligent in what you do every day. Then he was told to go to Jordan. And at Jordan, that's where the Jews crossed over on dry ground. But they did the same thing at the Red Sea. Remember what happened at the Red Sea, though? Moses says, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And he took that staff and touched the waters, and the waters parted. Jericho is a little bit different. When he got to Jericho, you know what they had to do? They literally had, and it was time when the rivers was overflowing their banks. I mean, the water's rushing down. And they're going to have to step in it this time. It's going to take a great leap of faith. And what God wants you to understand, folks, in these, before you ever go home, the life that pleases him is a life of faith. You're going to have to step out sometimes by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then I noticed this. After he'd went to those three places, you got to verse number 11. And it came to pass as they still went on. Where were they headed? Where were they headed to? I don't know. You don't know. 
Here's the thing, folks. I don't know what tomorrow holds. But we just got to keep, keep going. Press toward the mark. Whatever you're going to have to face tomorrow, face it with the eye of faith. The eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But you know, then Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind. Three places I truly believe every child of God needs to spend time at before they leave this world. But you know, there was one thing that I did not mention when I was telling you all this. One thing that I believe was probably more important than anything I have said so far. You see, there was three places that God told Elijah to go to on his last day. But if you go back to first, second Kings, our chapter number two, there were actually four places mentioned. Four places. The last three basically were all a result of the first one. If you don't have the first one, I'm going to be honest with you, the last three don't really matter. You see, what I did not tell you, I told you where they went, but I didn't tell you where they started. Where did they start the last day from? Verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha, notice, from Gilgal. Gilgal. That's where it started. What does Gilgal picture? Look over real quickly to Joshua chapter number 4. What do we find at Gilgal? In verse number 19 of Joshua 4. And the people came up out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. So this would be around April the 10th. Notice, and encamped in Gilgal, in the east border of Jericho. So they camp out at Gilgal. So the first thing you're going to find at Gilgal, Gilgal was a place of rest. Rest. They suddenly stop their journey and they rest. You see, God knows what lies ahead for all of us. And God knows we're going to need strength for the battle. Remember Elijah, again, who we're talking about? Remember he went up on Mount Carmel and he had that great contesting him and all those false prophets. And he had all those false prophets killed that day when Elijah won that great victory. And it hadn't rained for three and a half years. And Elijah tells Ahab, you better hurry up down this mountain because it's about to pour. And the Bible says that Elijah outrun Ahab. Ahab's on horses. Elijah outruns him down the mountain. And he gets down the mountain. Ahab goes and tells his wife, Jezebel, what? Elijah had done, and Jezebel says, tomorrow this time, he's going to be like him false prophets. He's going to be a dead man. Well, Elijah hears about it. He gets so discouraged, he goes and he sits underneath this tree, and he says, God, just kill me. When he saw that in his mind, he saw Jezebel killing him. And so he says, God, just beat her to the punch. And then the Bible says he goes to sleep. I imagine Elijah's wore out. And God comes, the Bible says an angel comes and touches him, wakes him up. He's got a meal that I prepared for him. And he eats. Then he goes back to sleep again. And the angel comes and taps on the shoulder again and says, Elijah, rise and eat. You know what he says? Because the journey ahead is too strong for you and you need strength for the journey. So Elijah ate. And then he left. And he went on those two meals for 40 days. My point is, folks, God knows there's some battles ahead for all of us. God knows there's going to be uh, times, you know, we, we got to fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know what God knows we all need is a resting place. 
Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Gilgal was a place needed, especially in our day, folks. But then I noticed this. Not only was it a resting place, but then in verse 20, it says there was 12 stones they took. Remember, they took those 12 stones out of Jordan and put it over there. They, and, and, and they put them at Gilgal. And he told them there, so when your children ask, well, these stones mean you can tell them. So not only was Gilgal a place of rest, but it's also a place of remembrance. Precious memories were made at Gilgal. Because, see, people forget. And those stones were put there. We, we talked about that. I don't have time to go into all the details about Nehemiah and the booths that they were supposed to put up every year at the Feast of Tabernacles. For 1,000 years, they have been observing the Feast of Tabernacles, but they had not been living in booths for seven days like God told them to do. And they, the reason why they forgot, they cast the law behind their back. They got rid of that book. They stopped reading their Bibles. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, when they opened the book back up, oh, wait a minute, we should have been doing this. That's why you need to spend time in the Bible. And then I noticed this. As it went on in chapter 5 at Gilgal, God told them to circumcise all the people that were born in the wilderness because the ones that, that came out of Egypt were circumcised, but the ones born in the wilderness were not circumcised. And so he told them to circumcise them. And so Gilgal was a place of relationship. It was there that they identified with the God of Israel. He's our God. We belong to him. It was a place of relationship. But why, folks? What was it that made all of that possible? Chapter 5, verse number 9. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you, wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal until this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. Notice the feast they keep there is the Passover feast. Remember what happened at the Passover? When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb, folks. And so what I believe, Gilgal, to me, is a picture of Calvary. And what Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price for us. Because of Calvary, we can have rest. Because of Calvary, thank God, we've got some memories that are precious. Because of Calvary, folks, we became a part of the family of God. That's what makes Gilgal so special. And so you see, my point is, you may go to Bethel, and you may go to Jericho, and you may go to Jordan, but if you've never been to Gilgal, if you've never been to Calvary, nothing else is going to really matter. Have you been to Calvary? Have you got those memories? You know, the special thing about all of this is it just absolutely amazed me. This is where the journey starts. You can go through life and you can become, you make a name for yourself, you can do all kinds of stuff. I just got news for you. Life don't really start till you go to Calvary. You go to Calvary by faith and trust Jesus Christ. That's where life begins. But here's the thing, folks. We don't have to go back to Calvary to get saved over and over and over again. Jesus Christ paid the price once. Once. You only have to go to Calvary once for salvation. But I'm going to tell you what you better do. You better revisit Calvary a lot. Because that will keep you humble. And that will keep you thankful. And I noticed something. Remember what they're doing now? Remember what the Jews are going to do? They're going to go out and God says, I want you to go out and I want you to possess the land. They're going to have to go out and they're going to fight battle after battle after battle after battle. They're going to take town and city and town and city. Off, and they're supposed to possess the entire land. But I noticed something. 
I notice something. If you read on in the book of Joshua, and you get over, remember they got Jericho, and then they got Ai. And you read on over in chapter number 10, and you read where they go to this town, and God delivered this town into them, and God delivered that town into them, and God delivered that town into them. Do you know what they did after each victory? They kept going back to Gilgal. Is that amazing? They kept going back to Gilgal. I'm just telling you, you're going to face a lot of battles in this life, folks. A lot of battles. And every time God gives you the victory, first thing you ought to do, go back to your Gilgal and thank God for Calvary. It keeps us thankful and it keeps us humble. Let's pray. I have a song of invitation. Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that you give us to be here today. Lord, I realize before we leave this world, there's some places you want us to go to. But it all starts at Calvary. And I pray, Lord, that everybody in here has been to Calvary by faith. If not, may today be the day of their salvation. It's appointed to me once to die. You didn't make a way of escape from the first death but you did the second. I pray nobody here dies twice. That second death, they have no hope. So I pray everybody has been to Calvary by faith and trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But Lord, don't let us get too far from Calvary. Let us keep reminding ourselves over and over and over. <clears throat> reminding ourselves how thankful we should be how humble we should be. I know we face a lot of trials and tribulations. We get weary. Thank God we got a place of rest. A place that reminds us we're a part of the family of God. Because of a place where all our sins got rolled away. So now may your will be done this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Page 375, 375.